It's Friday, and I'm back with the next in our Fanzine Friday series. Today we're taking a look at the Oracle number five. Please stick around. I'm AZ Mountaineer. This is our channel, Old School Rules, where we celebrate the community of old school gamers and grognards who like classic RPGs, miniatures, magazines, and everything that goes with it. Each week on the Fanzine Friday series, I take a fanzine from my collection off the shelf for a closer look. Today, it's the Oracle number five from the autumn of 1983. Hope you enjoy the video. So today we're taking a look at the final issue that was produced by Chris Bigelow back in the early 1980s. You will recall Chris was a young guy who was in high school when he started this. He had dreams of grandeur, he used his father's company for some of the, the work, um, got to know people all over the country, including Tim Cask at Dragon Magazine, and people in New York and other artists, including uh, I think a couple issues ago, Clyde Caldwell did some art for his, for his fanzine. So all in all, I think he had a lot of success, even if he didn't always accomplish everything he set his mind to do. Uh, I had the original three issues, and then for issues four and five, I'm getting my material from this book that was printed 2015 era, maybe right around there. Tim Hutchins worked with Chris to re reproduce this and pr produce this thing called the Complete the Oracle. It's hardbound. If you can ever get a copy of it, I you know I highly recommend it. And so it has all the issues reprinted. It has an imagined issue number six that Tim put together, which we'll talk about next week. Some essays and some information about other things that he, he was working on. So for today, let's start by looking at the cover. This is Peter Laird, and he talks in here about meeting Peter uh, early on, and that's how he got connected to a number of other folks. But here's his drawing. I think it's the best artwork by far on any of his covers. I love this dragon. It reminds me a little bit of a Jeff Easley dragon, I guess. And this little imp looks a little cross between um, a cherub and an, an imp, I guess, with these like butterfly type wings. Really, really cool art. Blow that up a little bit so it's just a little bit uh, easier to see. So he has a table of contents that has regular features and specials. I have them all here put together. He's got his notes, his table of contents, and omens, which is his editorial. Reader's writings, those are letters. The Grimlock as a player character. The Dungeons of Kroom, this is level two. The Gateway of the Sword, William Fulweiler, wrote this uh, fiction. Then reader ideas, which are magic items, spells, new monsters, that kind of stuff. Play by mail gaming game reviews, the gamer exchange, and feedback. We'll talk about those things as we go through. In terms of contributors, Chris, again, under various pseudonyms, produces most of, the, most of this stuff, although Ronald Mark Pear is here again. He's in every issue of this uh, fanzine, and he does two of the big articles, the Grimlock and the, and the Adventure. And then Peter Laird did the cover art. So Omens is the editorial, and I think it merits some talking or sharing specifically we talk. So he starts off by saying he's only a little bit late, which he's pleased with. Remember, he's gone to a quarterly printing schedule, and this is from the autumn of 1983. Um, and he says, I've been asked, why are you only publishing quarterly? And he basically says, uh, I just don't have uh, the time to get it together. So listen to this. Um, there are several reasons why we don't do this. First of all, the staff, and remember, the staff is him. But he pretends because he has this big masthead, he has all these people working on his fancy. The staff is limited in the time available to work on this magazine. Our eight times a year schedule was too much. Quarterlies works out perfectly, as you can see, because we got this one out more or less on time. When the magazine starts generating more revenue and we can start paying our staff members, remember, that's just him, uh, we will be ready and willing to schedule and get this out more often. The other thing he talks about, he says that's a financial issue, is the content of the articles. He says, I get a number of submissions. A lot of them are not really up to the quality I would want to include. Certainly, I don't have enough material to put this out every month. Uh, and again says, if I had more money, I'd be able to pay people to, to provide me with articles. I'm not aware of any fanzine, frankly, or most magazines, that paid people to write articles. And I could certainly be wrong about that. I've never... Uh, asked Tim Cask, for example, about whether they, they paid people to, to write articles for Dragon Magazine. Certainly the submission guidelines that they had in there made it sound like, you know, you were just lucky to get your article published. But in any event, apparently, I think he mentioned that he had been paying some people to write for him. So that's another reason he can't get the content because he's, you know, paying people and doesn't have the money to do it. Uh, so that's one of the things that holds us back. But he says, you know, um, 
don't worry, great things are coming. That's always his attitude. Soon I'm going to be advertising again the Dragon. Maybe we'll get back up to a bi-monthly, back then to my eight, eight times a year, and ultimately once a month, which is his, he says is his ultimate goal. Um, they'd also like to know what else we're doing, and he reminds you that he has his play-by-mail game called Blade Quest, which he says is doing really well. And he had mentioned last time he was putting together an adventure called Witchery in El Caro. And I was raising the question about whether he'd ever sold any. According to his writing, he, he has. And in fact, he says, we've sold enough of those that were um, breaking even and we're gonna continue to sell them and probably make a little bit of money. So he's very excited about that. So excited that he's also now released a second item called the Island Campaign, a second adventure, which we'll talk about again here as we get to the end where he advertises things for sale. He's got his fiction fanzine called Augury, which he says is you know sort of losing a little bit of money, but almost getting up on its feet. And, uh, and he's had some people who, who wrote in and took up on the offer to get um, these things for half price. And so he's gonna continue that half price offer for, uh, for a little while longer. Okay, the reader's letters from the, from the, from the fans, right? Um, not surprisingly, the first one here is a response to last time's letter that was an open letter to Gary Gygax. Matt Lippo writes in and basically says he agrees with Merle Parnell um, completely that early on Gary wrote these things that really made the players feel special, that, that Gary was connected to them trying to give them good advice, answer their questions, and help explain the game in a, in a way that everybody appreciated. But then of late, he's taken on a tone that makes him sound, again, to the reader, superior, um, as if he thinks a lot of the players aren't really worth his time or effort or can't understand what he thinks is obvious. And again, offended that they are trying to make the game, at least for their own home table, better by changing the rules, adding rules, etc. And so again, it just really rubbed a lot of people the wrong way when, when he wrote that, that article in the Dragon Magazine. And it wasn't the only thing I think that he had said like that. The second thing is a letter from Mark Swanson talking about the letter in, or the article in Oracle number three about libraries, um, saying he's got some basically some corrections. He thinks the these areas were better lit than, than he let on and, and doesn't know that he agrees with some of the explanation in the article about how things would have been uh, cataloged or stored, etc. Now here's a fun one. Uh, Ronald Mark Perra writes the Grimlock as player character. And remember this art, Alan Hunter's art from the Fiend Folio. So Ronald is suggesting, hey, these would be good player characters, to not by themselves, to join your regular party. If you remember the Grimlock from the Fiend Folio, they're blind. Um, they can sense with their other heightened senses about 40 feet sort of area they can function, they can fight, et cetera, in that kind of area. Um, beyond that, they're basically blind. And so a horrible character, a race, if you're gonna ever be outside where things can attack you from a far distance, um, and not particularly great character class in a dungeon if you ever got some place where someone attacks you from further than 40 feet away. But there's, you know, the bottom line is they're they're really tough. Um, he has a weird way he wants you to roll their um, attributes. So here's what he has. It's just interesting. So 2d6 plus a d8 for strength, because right, rather than give him a bonus, he just gives him an extra die, I guess. If you if your natural roll is a 19, that's 1851. If your natural roll is a 20, it's 1890. And he says, oh, by the way, that. They don't even have a character class. You would write down fighter, but they're not really fighters. They're just, they use fighters for hit points, um, saving throws, and to hit rolls. But basically, they don't have a class. They're just a Grimlock. Uh, intelligence and Wisdom, you only get two D6, and for some reason, a two becomes a three. That's the way he does it. Um, constitution, two D6 plus a D8, um, but you can only get an 18. And then Dexterity is normal, Charisma is normal but you have a negative modifier anytime you're dealing with people who aren't Grimlocks. Um, they don't like metal armor. They don't really like magic, but they'll use magic. They get a plus one on saves because I guess they're kind of hardy like dwarves. Um, 
and they're really aggressive and sort of bloodthirsty, but they'll be very loyal to anyone who's been loyal to them. So that's his idea. And I think the gist of it, he ends up by saying, like, I got all kinds of articles like this that I can keep writing. Because his idea is all kinds of humanoid um, creatures, if you will, that are in the monster manual could be uh, character races. And he encourages people to think about that, even though, you know, they're going to have the negatives. People would shun them, maybe don't like them. Party ends up in fights all the time because of that particular character. But he says, you know, there's no reason particularly to exclude them. It can make your game more fun. And if you remember, early on, Gary had written that all kinds of other, we'll call them monsters or uh, creatures, could be player characters. He even said a, a dragon could be as long as you tuned it appropriately to keep it in level with the rest of the, uh, of the players. So the Dungeons of Kroom. This is the adventure. Ronald Mark Pear again. This is the second level. Remember last time you were on the first level. Um, you've ostensibly successfully negotiated that level. Probably according to this, haven't killed everybody. You've reached detente. You've come back out and the kobolds who were on the first level now have reached a, a treaty with the people in the city where they stop eating, kidnapping people. In return, they get actual food like from the farmers so that they can be fed and uh, they're allowed to come into town. He says, look, they're not always the greatest, but you know, some of the people, human beings that are here aren't the greatest either. So it, it's okay. Well, now suddenly people start disappearing again. And some people blame the kobolds. The kobolds say, it's not us. You've been drafted to go back in now to level two and see what's going on. And so when you get to level two, you will be able to find, um, solve the mystery and uh, you eventually uh, if you do it correctly, meet the creature, which is the, um, what do they call it? The, I think it's like the nameless God or something like that. And, uh, and solve the mystery and sort of save the town from, from this evil. Um, it's a good one. You know, it's a simple dungeon. He said, I designed it to be fairly simple and straightforward. As he said, I don't want players to spend time trying to learn how to be good mappers. I want them to play the game and and enjoy it's it's really decent it's very simple everything sort of hangs together it's fairly logical um again probably one session unless it's a really short session it might take you two times to get around and not particularly deadly it's for low level characters but uh yeah i thought this one was pretty well done here's the fiction it's you know i think it's a decent uh, it's a decent story it's called the gateway of the sword uh it's in it, this one is more um fantasy fiction the character here, Alvarez, is a, is a half, father was a demon, mother was a human, and he's trying to become, his goal is to, he wants to become a magic user. Reader ideas are always fun, and he's had them in most of his fanzines. So this first one here is the Hourglass of Time. It's a magic item. It's a small hourglass, and whenever you turn it over, it will instantly stop time for everybody except for the person who's holding it within a 30-foot radius. You can do that once a day. It only lasts for one round or 60 seconds, right? Pretty powerful if used intelligently, but they add in. But don't forget, you should constantly be checking to see whether it accidentally rolls around. Like if you put it in your backpack, it can roll around and just freeze time. And then nobody's holding it, so you're just all sort of stuck there. And remember, only a 30-foot radius. So somebody who's 40 feet away, time doesn't stop for them. You're all just stuck there, inanimate, unable to move. They could shoot you with arrows or whatever. Maybe the arrows freeze when they hit the bubble, but the instant that ends, at least in my view, those things would continue their trajectory, right? And they would they would probably hit you. So could be some fun. Next, we have the spider fish. You can see down here in the drawing, and he um, exudes some type of uh, secretion, and he can make essentially strands. And he'll, he's intelligent enough; he'll connect those back and forth across rocks or the riverbank in a fast-moving water. And so fish are sort of the current brings a fish into it. He comes up and has like a sucker mouth, latches onto the side of you, bores a hole through you and begins to just suck life, essence, blood, guts out of you. Um, normally fish, but if any human beings got in the water, then he would do that to them uh, as well. Next, we have the mantis shield. It's a magician's creation. It looks like the head of a praying mantis, so she even has the little mandibles on it. And it's basically a plus one shield, but you can't, there's a button um, like a, a little button 
on the shield arm that you can push and the mantis um, pinchers will close and you can use it to try and grab someone's um, sword hand or their leg or whatever and cause some damage and also in, um, immobilize them. And finally we have magic candles. I like these kind of items. There's uh, five or six different versions. You set them down, you light them, and then the magic takes effect, right? Uh, the first one is madness. If you look at it, it just sort of, in failure save, you're sort of mesmerized and you'll just sit there slack dolled until the end of a turn. And if, if your party doesn't save you from that before the end of a turn, then you will um, go insane, which is a little extreme. The next one is warmth. You just light it up, gives you warmth so you'd be immune from cold, which is an excellent magic item. Light, which is brighter than normal, so it's a continual light spell. The everlasting version, which is basically the light of a torch, but it will never, um, the wax never melts, so it's, it burns forever until you, you can blow it out, but it will never burn out. Um, the candle of goodness basically gives you a 10 foot uh, protection from evil radius, uh, plus one on attack, saves, and plus one armor class bonus. And then finally, because you always got to stick a bad one in there, right? The candle of suffocation, so you light it, all the oxygen in a 50 foot area is instantly consumed, and so there's no oxygen left in that radius. And so if you're in there when you light the candle, the candle um, obviously will burn out, but um, you will lose one hit point per round until the candle goes down and it's um, and it'll go down by it'll go down by one inch when it goes off and then it'll go out and then everybody's gonna lose a hit point while they're in there okay play by mail gaming um, the aeolian harp by a company called the talisman he likes it he says it's a pretty good one it's a super super popular game reviews Three, he really likes them. Harn by Columbia Games. Excellent, excellent products. Uh, as they say, the most detailed and logical, comprehensive and consistent fantasy world yet published. I think that's pretty much spot on. It's really, really good. Wizards by Avalon Hill, which is, as they say, more of a board game. Uh, and they like it. They think it's really well-designed, well-executed. And finally, The Complete Spellcaster by Bard Games. They also did The Complete Alchemist, right? Complete Adventure, I think. Um, and again, he says it's a really good book uh, of additional spells and, and thoughts about creating a spellcasting character. So here on the last page, he's, I love this first thing, which is the Gamer Exchange. He's been talking about this from issue one. He kept saying, readers, tell me if you're interested. And he kept saying, no one's interested in it. But finally, I guess he doesn't care. He's doing it anyway. And this is to let you advertise anything related to fantasy role-playing, clubs, organizations, looking for people, DM available, you know, all that kind of stuff, merchandise you might want to sell or trade, all that. And so he's like, he's basically sent it in and he's going to service the clearing house. Here's his feedback for the last issue. Favorite thing were the reader's ideas. That's the magic items, spells, etc. Um, other things that people like, the review of gaming publications, which are fanzines. And uh, people really like the Dungeon of Croom level one. Uh, I was a little surprised, you know, the readers writing the open letter to Gary. It was okay, but it was it was not the favorite. So um, some people clearly felt that way, but others, I guess, felt other stuff was a lot better. And then here he's asking for feedback for, for next time. So here's his internal advertisement for his company and what they have for sale. And two things really interesting of note, right? Witchery and Elkara, which I guess he says he sold. So I got to reach out to some of my collector friends who are much, um, have bigger collections than I do and see if, what I can learn about this. And the second one is something he just calls the Island Campaign, which he says in this issue he's already started producing. So really cool things there. And of course, Blade, Qu Blade Quest, which is his PB, play by mail game. Augury, which is fiction, fantasy, and the Oracle itself. And again, the back, um, the back page is just blank like this. So that's it for the uh, Fanzine Friday and the Oracle number five. Hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, hope you're enjoying our series and I hope you're subscribed. If you have friends who might enjoy our, uh, what we're doing, please send them our way. Hopefully they'll be subscribers as well. And until next time, my friends, keep rolling 20s.